Hi everyone, um, this video is just going to be some revision for the SAC for Unit 4 Outcome 1. Um, I've based this on the survey um, and the things that you guys said you wanted to go over again. So just make sure you do go through um, the checklist. Um, just note that in the checklist there's a section there on um, Darwin's Finches and BMP4. Um, that's not going to come up in this SAC, so we'll go over that um, a bit later on, so don't worry about that one. Okay, so we're going to start with um, looking at the mutations and um, causes of changing allele frequencies again. So um, with mutations, we, we mainly look at the impact of point mutations, which is when you get a change to a single point of DNA. Um, and there's a couple of different things that can happen. You can have a base substitution. So if we're comparing to this top bit of DNA, um, you can see that the T there has been substituted for a C. There are three different impacts that a base substitution can have on the protein that um, the gene codes for. So a missense um, mutation is when that changed point, uh, that changed base will result in a different amino acid. Okay, so instead of getting one amino acid, you get a different one. So that's a missense mutation. You can have a silent mutation when even though there's a change in the base, um, it still codes for the same amino acid. Um, so that won't affect the resulting protein. So you, you wouldn't even necessarily know that you have that mutation. Um, and then you can also get what is called a nonsense mutation, which is when um, that new base ends up coding for a stop codon. And that means that the protein will be cut short um, at wh whatever point in the gene where that mutation occurred. OK, so they are all substitution mutations. Um, another point mutation that can happen is a base deletion. So that T, um, that thymine, has been deleted completely. Um, on the opposite end of that, you can have a base insertion where an extra um, nucleotide is inserted there. Um, both of these are what we call frame shift mutations because they change the length of the DNA. So here, that whole section of DNA is one base shorter. In this one, um, it is one base longer, which might not sound like a lot, but every amino acid after that point will be changed because it's changed the position of those codons. Remember, three um, bases codes for one amino acid. So all of the amino acids after that will be changed. Um, the impact this has on the final protein is that it, it will be significantly altered. OK, so it could still result in a functional protein, but not the protein it was supposed to be. Um, but often this could result in non-functional proteins. OK, so looking now at causes of changing allele frequencies, so how the frequency of particular alleles changes within a population. Um, and there was a few terms that we went through with this. One is that this can happen through gene flow. So if you look here, you've got one population here and another population here. Gene flow refer refers to migration between those two populations. So, you know, if one of these beetles migrates over here, um, where at the moment there's only white beetles and it brings its black allele and then it breeds within um, that population, it will introduce that new allele. Um, then there's genetic drift and there's two different examples of genetic drift. OK, one is called the founder effect. Um, and that's when a small group of individuals form a new population. OK, so these um, individuals ended up in a new place um, where that uh, species didn't previously exist and they start a new population there. And you can see that this new population doesn't represent the original population because it only had a small amount of genetic variation in it. Um, another, the other version of genetic drift is called the bottleneck effect. Um, and this is where there's some kind of chance event. It could be a flood. It could be something like that, where you know a whole big section um, of the population dies. And then there's a few remaining individuals 
Um, again, they don't represent that original population. Um, and then as they survive and they reproduce, their genes are the ones that get passed on. Okay, it's important to, to note that both of these things are chance events. Okay, it's not because of natural selection. You know, these bugs weren't more suited to their environment. Just by chance, they survived um, and therefore the future generations have their genes. Um, then there's also natural selection, which we'll go through again now in a second. Um, and artificial selection, which is really um, just used you know, in agriculture um, and in domestication of animals, which is to do with um, choosing beneficial um, organisms to breed. So in that way, kind of humans are impacting um, on the alleles. So natural selection, um, you know, you've been through this quite a few times, but there's some key words you need to make sure you're thinking about. Um, for natural selection to occur, there needs to be genetic variation in a population. Okay, so we've got different traits um, and some of the individuals have what is called a selective advantage because their phenotype, whether that is their height, whether it's their speed, whether it's the way they metabolize food, any of their traits are more advantageous than others. Um, in natural selection, those individuals that have the advantage survive, okay, while the, the individuals with non-advantageous traits are killed. Um, and the things that basically determine what is an advantage and what isn't is called a selection pressure. Okay, so that could be something like predators, it could be the climate, whether certain organisms are more suited to certain climates, it could be the food availability, anything that determines that, you know, having a long neck is better than having a short neck. Um, so the individuals with the advantages survive, they reproduce, and then their offspring inherit their alleles, their genes, um, for those phenotypes. And over many, many, many generations, um, we see more of the advantageous phenotypes because they're the individuals that have survived and reproduced and had offspring. All right, speciation is um, basically when a new species is formed. Okay, so this occurs when um, there are significant changes to the gene pool um, and they become permanent changes and we end up with new species. This takes place over very, very, very long periods of time. We're talking millions of years. Um, and it's important to note that for this to happen, there has to be some kind of isolation. Um, and what we mean is um, generally that, that species will start to kind of diverge in different directions um, and not be interbreeding with each other. Okay, so that isolation could be geographic. If we look at this example here, you know, we had one species of rabbit, um, you know, and then some of them ended up on one side of a river and some of them ended up on the other side of the river. So they were geographically isolated from each other and couldn't breed with each other because of that isolation. Um, isolation can also be reproductive, which means that maybe these populations can mix with each other, but for whatever, whatever reason, they're not mating with each other. Okay, sometimes that's because of things like you know, their mating calls or their mating rituals become different. It could be that they're, you know, becoming active at different parts of the day, um, but that's what reproductive isolation is. Um, this here is an example, um, a specific example called allopatric speciation. That's basically speciation that occurs due to that geographic isolation. Okay, so again, I'll, I'll just go over this again quickly. Um, we ended up with one population here, one population here. They couldn't breed with each other because there was a river running through the middle. Over long periods of time, they undergo separate mutations. Remember, mutations are completely random. So, you know, these mutations occurred to the ears over here, but not on this side. There was obviously changes to the colour over here. Um, so each of those species is going through its own version of natural selection over time. And then it gets to a point where now these are actually so different from each other 
that they can no longer breed to produce fertile offspring, which is the definition of a species. Okay, this is just a good point to um, mention divergent versus convergent evolution. So what we've just talked about is divergent evolution, where we have a parent species and then speciation occurs where they become different to each other. Okay, so when we look at um, human evolution, for example, they are all examples of divergent evolution where changes started to occur and the species start to become more different from each other. Convergent evolution is um, more to do with the fact that you have very different um, ancestor species, but the species um, develop similar characteristics or traits or behaviours. Okay, so for example, birds and bats. Okay, birds are birds, they're of the ave family. Bats are mammals, but they look quite similar in a lot of ways. They can both fly because they've both um, had different types of mutations that resulted in them having wings and then those wings are an advantage so it was selected for with the birds it was selected for with bats so they've become quite similar to each other but genetically they are very very different okay so um, generally when we look at these things divergent evolution is often when we will have um, homologous features so for example um, you know, humans and whales have very similar bone structure in our hands and, and whales' fins, even though we're clearly very, very, very different organisms. But we're both mammals and, and we've, we've at one point evolved from a, a um, similar parent species. Whereas convergent evolution is those analogous features. So, for example, the wings of an insect and a bird and a bat are very different internally, but they, they serve similar functions. All right, the evidence of evolution that we have looked at. Um, I'll just quickly go over this timeline again. I don't want you to get too caught up with this. You don't need to know the different periods and, and times when things happened, but you know, basically um, different geological time periods are um, named based on certain events or um, rock formations that formed in that time. What it is useful to know is just this very simple kind of timeline um, and we're talking really here about the, the timeline of life. Life began, began extremely simply and then over time became more complex, which, you know, kind of makes sense. So the first living things were prokaryotes. Okay, so very simple, single celled bacterial type organisms. Um, then single cell eukaryotes um, developed and these these were um, you know organisms that, that had organelles and mitochondria but were still very very simple. Then you know we started to get multicellular eukaryotes again very very simple kind of you know slug like organisms. Um, then simple soft bodied organisms and then organisms with exoskeletons, so those skeletal structures. So you can see becoming a bit more complex. Um, and then plants, flowering plants, um, you know, evolved after, you know, the, the most simple organisms with exoskeletons, because um, chloroplasts evolved after mitochondria. Um, and then, you know, from there, you know, you could start tracing things like birds, and reptiles, dinosaurs, um, you know, mammals are, are pretty new to the scene, really. Okay, so just make sure you're always thinking that it started extremely simply and then got more complex over time. Um, again, you don't need to remember any of these, these kind of mass extinction events, um, but it's just important that you're aware that they happened because obviously, you know, every time there was a mass extinction event, life changed significantly okay so you know 95 percent of 
species that existed during you know this particular extinction event died out and then you know new organisms evolved over time and then 70 to 80 percent of those died out and then new ones evolved again okay so um, it's just a bit more um, information in terms of how diversity of life has changed over time all right, fossilization. There's a few things you need to know um, in regards to fossils. The first one is the steps of fossilization. Um, obviously, for something to become fossilized, it needs to, well, yes, it needs to die first if it, if it was a living thing. Um, and then that, that dead organism is very, very rapidly covered up by sediment. So this is um, common on things like the ocean floor and things like that, where it can be very rapidly covered. So you can see now that sediment is covering that dead organism very quickly. Um, this is important to stop scavengers from eating that dead body. Obviously, then it can't be fossilized. Um, it also prevents it from decomposing too quickly. Okay, So for something to fossilize, it needs to decompose very slowly. So by being covered quickly, there's no oxygen, there's no heat, there's no light, any of those things that speed up decomposing. Um, over time, layers of sediment stack up on top of it okay so um, you know they had that initial layer that protected the organism and then more and more layer uh, more and more sediment layered on top and that ends up forming sedimentary rock okay so the pressure of that sediment causes um, rock to form again we're talking over really really long periods of time here and while that rock is forming around it the organism itself decomposes really slowly and then minerals take the place of where that tissue was, okay? Um, it is most common that fossils occur in bony um, and hard tissue, so things like teeth as well. Um, soft tissue decomposes very quickly. So there are, uh, you know, fossils of soft tissue organisms but generally it's much more likely to happen for um, an animal that had a lot of um, bone or hard tissue. All right, one way that um, we can look at the age of fossils is through relative dating. That's basically looking at the fact that you have different layers of rock or strata that form on the earth. You know, if this was the core of the earth and then this is the surface, the rock closer to the surface is the youngest or the newest rock, okay? Um, so stratigraphy is the study of these rock formations. And basically it says that this fossil is older than this fossil because it is in a rock layer that is much deeper um, than this one. Um, sometimes you will, you know, you might get a fossil found in this layer and this layer and this layer and this layer, which would tell us that whatever species that fossil belonged to existed for a very long period of time because it existed over multiple different geologic time periods. Um, absolute dating is a type of dating that tells us how old rock is. Okay, so not just whether a rock is older than another rock, but this rock is 120 million years old. Um, this is done through radioactive isotope dating. Um, the principles behind this is that elements um, decay at a known rate. Um, and it's important that you note that that rate is different for different elements, which we'll go through again in a second. Um, the way um, the, the dating kind of works is that we measure the amount of time it takes for 50% of the element to decay. Okay, so you can see here, um, you know, this was when a rock first formed, it was 100% made, what it, it had um, one particular element in it. At this point, half of that element is gone. Okay, and that is called one half life. Okay, the amount of time it takes for half the element to decay. Then the next half-life is the amount of time it takes for half 
of this half to decay. Okay, so it's half of half is the second half-life. The third half-life is half of that quarter. Okay, so now that bit has decayed and there's only um, one eighth of it left. Okay, so that was the third half-life. The fourth half-life is half of that eighth has now decayed and there's one sixteenth left. Okay, so the rate of decay happens kind of at this reverse exponential rate. The time of each half-life stays stable. Okay, so an example of this, if, for example, we're looking at something where the half-life is 5,000 years, that means this first half-life, which is 5,000 years old, half of that element um, has decayed. The second half-life is now 10,000 years, so it was 5,000 plus another 5,000, a quarter of the element um, is still there. The next half-life, we had another five, so at 15,000 years, there's one eighth of that parent element there, um, and so on and so forth. Um, all you really need to know about the different types of radioactive isotope dating is what age they really work for. So carbon dating um, is good for up to about 50,000 years. Okay, so carbon decays into nitrogen, it's probably worth knowing that. Um, but carbon dating can be used to age dead organisms um, up to 50,000 years. After that point, there is so little carbon left that it's not possible to get um, an accurate measure of how long ago that thing had died. Because basically once all that carbon is gone, we don't know did that carbon finish decaying yesterday or has it been gone for a million years. Okay, so in terms of evolution, 50,000 years is not very long at all, okay, but it can be useful for um, some more modern um, decomposed animals. Um, two types of dating that are worth knowing are uranium lead dating and potassium argon dating. They can both age things extremely old, okay, so they can date um, rocks or shells from 100,000 years up to four and a half billion years old, which is the age of Earth. Okay, so they're the ones that would be used for the majority of um, types of fossils that we would talk about in terms of things like dinosaurs or um, even older human ancestors. All right, we looked at a few types of molecular evidence. So evidence from molecules, mostly DNA and um, amino acids. Okay, so we'll quickly go over these again. Um, there's a few terms in here. Molecular homology is basically just the study of how similar um, the molecules are between different species. Okay, so that could be the DNA or the proteins, um, you know, looking at their amino acid sequences. Okay, so um, this example looks at um, the amount of similarity in their gene and the similarity in their proteins. So you can see here, if we're comparing humans to chimpanzees, 99.6% similar in a certain gene. Um, the protein is exactly the same. Okay, so the more similar, um, the more closely related two species are. Um, mitochondrial DNA can be a really useful type of DNA to study. So all mitochondria have their own DNA source. Um, all you really need to know about this is why it is really useful for evolutionary biologists. Um, and the reasons for that is firstly, it doesn't undergo recombination. What that means is your mitochondria come from your mother. Her mitochondria came from her mother. Her mitochondria came from her mother. So all mitochondria come from the egg. Um, so there's no jumbling up of DNA. Okay, so it, it doesn't undergo recombination. It's a more pure source of DNA to track. Um, and then also it mutates at a fast and stable rate. So um, because that rate is quite stable, um, it's quite useful to look at how many mutations have occurred and to estimate how long it would have taken for that to happen. Um, the way they do that 
is using what's called the molecular clock. Again, don't get too caught up in trying to figure out how to read this. All you need to know is this is used by comparing the DNA of two um, current species or species of the same age. So let's say humans and chimps okay so we're not comparing humans and i don't know australopithecines it's two existing species you get the dna from both of them and then basically scientists would um, count the number of differences there are in the dna and then using the molecular clock where they know the rate of mutation they can estimate how long ago these were the same species okay um, again this is based on the fact that dna mutates at a known and stable rate so if we know it takes one million years for one mutation to occur and we looked at two different species and there was one difference between them it would be a million years ago that they were the same Right, DNA hybridization is another technique of comparing the DNA of two different species. Okay, so you need DNA strands of two species, um, they're mixed together and then they're observed to see how many bonds form between them. So, you know, let's say we had this DNA from a human, the DNA from chimp. Um, they're split in half so you get a single strand and a single strand mix them together and see how many bonds are made indicating that those bits of dna are the same as each other um, and then you know where bonds don't form they're the bits of dna that are different or not um, complementary to each other um, the way that this is interpreted is that the more bonds that are created the more closely related the species are. So these two here would be identical. They're probably from the same species because the DNA completely bonded with each other. You do need to know the steps of doing this, okay? How this is done in a lab, okay? So we'll go over this again quickly. You get the DNA from each species. The DNA gets heated to 87 degrees um, to break the hydrogen bonds because remember we want single stranded DNA so that will get broken and that will get broken at 87 degrees um, that process is called denaturation the same way that um, proteins denature DNA denatures okay so now we've got single strands they're going to get mixed together okay and then the mixture gets cooled down to allow hydrogen bonds to reform okay so let's say we got bonds forming there there was a few that didn't form um, that process is called annealing okay it has to be cooled down because if it stayed at 87 degrees hydrogen bonds won't form at that temperature um, and then that is when the dna will get looked at and compared and seeing if it has fully hybridized and they're the same species whether they haven't mixed at all or whether they've partially hybridized the way they do that, no one is going to be sitting around counting how many bonds there are. They will very gently reheat the temperature again and then measure the temperature at which those two strands separate. Okay, um, really important to get this bit right. If two species are very closely related, it will take a higher temperature so, you know, close, very close to 87 degrees for them to separate, okay? If they're hardly held on to each other at all, they'll separate at a much lower temperature because there's not as many hydrogen bonds. All right, all of that kind of information is used to construct phylogenetic trees. These are basically... Um, family histories that show the relationships between species. Um, you have, there will, you know, there should be a year kind of measurement. Um, it can run up and down, it could be side to side. But basically if we look at this, all of these species at the top are the current species. 
So this shows that humans are most closely related to chimpanzees. Um, and if we were to look at the time, the fact that, you know, we intersected at that point means that around, you know, four million years ago-ish, we were the same species, okay? So that would be the point of the common ancestor, okay? If we wanted to look at when was the last time humans and old world monkeys shared a common ancestor, we'd have to trace back to this line here, basically. So that would be around 25 million years ago. At that point, um, old world monkeys and um, the other kind of more great ape type um, animals started to speciate or diverge. Okay, so it's a really good example of divergent evolution. They started to change and become more different to each other. Um, this was a question I don't think we ever actually got around to in class, um, but a really good way of showing how you would need to solve two different things to complete a phylogenetic tree. So this shows us um, the characteristics of a few different types of animals. It gives us some of their features. Um, so we really need to use this information to complete this. So we have um, whales have thick limb bones and thick inner ear bones. Um, pigs have thin limb bones and thin inner ear bones. Hippopotami have thick limbs but thin inner ear bones. Um, and then this particular um, extinct animal that they were looking at for this question had thick limb bones and thick inner ear bones. So what you're basically trying to do is figure out which of these are more similar to each other and put them in here. So up here we've got thick and thick and here we've got thick and thick. So they're the only two of all of these um, that are the same as each other. So that means these two are the most closely related. So we would want to pop them in these two boxes because this is the most closely related because all the others go further back to find um, how closely related they are. So it's said here that cetaceans is going to be the letter A. So let's pop an A in here. Um, and I major is the letter D. So you would put um, the D in there. Then the next one, um, the hippopotami has thick limb bones, but thin ear bones. And then this one is thin and thin. So these are more similar to this than they are to pigs because there's at least this part of it is thick. And so hippopotami is the letter C, so they would go there. And then the least similarly related is this one here, which has, you know, completely different structures for both the limbs and the inner ear bones, which is our pigs, which is the letter B. Okay, so it's a tricky question. There's a lot of information to it, um, but it is actually achievable if you break it down. All right, the final topic is looking at hominin evolution, um, so the evolution of humans and our ancestors. Um, it's important that you know some of the key players um, in order. So the earliest hominin is um, considered to be Australopithecus afarensis. Okay, there's more evidence now that this was yeah, closer to 4 million years than 3 million years. We found older fossils now that tell us that Australopithecines were around a bit longer. Um, they were the first upright walking um, primates, and that's basically what they have determined as being um, human ancestors. Okay, so they're the earliest. Then we had some divergence, you know, a, a, a branch of Australopithecines evolved but they they didn't thrive and they eventually died out so these lines stop at around 1.8 million years and this one kind of died out about 1.5 million years ago um, but this side really thrived okay so um, some of the australopithecines started to diverge and eventually speciated into homo habilis homo habilis was around 2 million years ago very 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 primitive human-like um, animal that was able to use tools. Then Homo habilis speciated into Homo erectus, um, which was one of the first kind of more complex um, hominin species, able to use fire, kind of, you know, in quite social groups, starting to think about the environment a bit more. 
Um, and then we started to get our Homo sapiens um, speciating from that. Um, really important to note, there's a lot of different versions of these these types of trees. When more when more evidence becomes available, new fossils get found, DNA evidence is looked at. These things change quite a lot. But this order is very much agreed upon that this is the order they came in. Um, the debate is more around, you know, did Homo sapiens um, evolve, you know, from Homo erectus or was there a bit more um, of other types of speciation occurring? Um, but we do know that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, coexisted, so lived side by side quite recently. We're going to get back to that in a minute. Um, really important that you know the changes to certain structures over time. Okay, so if we're comparing back to, say, Australopithecine, um, our very early ancestor, the changes that have occurred. So you can break them down into parts of the body. Changes that have occurred to the skull. So firstly, our cranial capacity has gotten bigger because of our big brains. Okay, so that has gotten much larger. Um, the face has become a lot flatter. Okay, if you look here at the face of a, a great ape, maybe a gorilla, it's on quite a slant because they still walk on all fours, whereas we have pretty much a flat face. If you remove the nose, flat face because we are standing upright, we are looking directly forward. Um, the foramen magnum, the hole at the base of the skull where the spine inserts, um, has become more central. Again, because our spine inserts right in the middle of our skull now, whereas with you know the great apes, it would have inserted here, so it would have been towards the back. Um, other changes, our jaw, our teeth, um, our brow ridge above our eyes, and the zygomatic arch, which is this kind of bit on the side of the um, jaw, have become much smaller. The reasons for all of this, like I said, the large brains is the reason for the bigger cranial capacity. Um, the changes to the position of the foramen magnum and the flat face are because we walk on two legs now, so being bipedal. And then the changes around the face, the jaw, the teeth are to do with the change in diet. We've moved more towards eating meat and being able to cook food, um, which meant less chewing, um, less having to use those really big muscles in the face. Moving down now towards the torso. Um, so the changes over time is that our rib cage has become rounder and shorter. So if we look at this, it's quite a round um, torso compared, uh, uh, rib cage compared to the great apes, which have quite a narrow, long torso. Um, really important, our spine has this really important S shape, which basically allows our weight to be carried straight down here. Okay, a great ape because they're actually not standing upright, they're standing more at an angle, their spine is less curved because their, their weight goes down that way, it doesn't go down along their spine. Um, also, our arms have become shorter compared to our body. So if you look at a gorilla here, they really need long arms because they're still putting their weight through it. We have um, longer legs relative to our arms because they're doing all of the work. Um, the changes around here, again, all kind of relate to being bipedal. So whether that's to do with the spine being able to support the weight um, or the fact that we use our arms very differently now. We're not using them to climb trees. We're using them to carry iPhones. Um, moving down to the lower limbs. So the pelvis. So here, if we look at a human pelvis, is much wider and also shorter than, say, a great ape. Um, we have what's called this carrying angle in our hips. So our femur moves in um, towards our knees and then our knee goes straight down. Um, that's really important for bipedalism because if our, if you know, this here is a great eight, if your legs are like that and you're not walking in a straight line, you're basically walking kind of side to side. It uses a lot of energy. Um, we have a really prominent heel bone. So at the bottom of the heel, you know, you've got that um, 
prominent heel bone, which means that when you walk, your heel strikes the ground first and you roll off it. Again, it makes walking much more efficient. Um, we have an arch in our foot. So again, it really supports um, efficient walking and our big toe has become much straighter again to support efficient walking. Whereas um, great apes and even some of the very early human ancestors had more of this, this um, toe kind of out towards the side because um, those changes have happened over time. Um, here's just some pictures of different um, skulls. So again, looking at things like the angle over time, the size of the cranial capacity, um, this arch here has become much smaller, um, the brow ridge is much smaller. Um, so it is good that you can identify different skull types. Um, this is the foramen magnum that I was talking about. So if we're looking at, you know, from here upwards and from here upwards, um, this is much more central on a human than it is on an ape. Um, again, just because of where the spine inserts. Um, the pelvis, so here is the human, that very kind of bowl-shaped pelvis. Um, a lot of that is to do with carrying weight. Um, and then also for um, females that will carry a child, that will obviously sit directly on the pelvis, whereas with a chimp, again, they're kind of on all fours, so the weight distribution is a bit different. Um, and then again, changes to the foot. So this nice arch here, that really prominent heel bone, that nice um, flat toe to support that, that push off and, and really efficient walking. Okay, we're almost there. Um, there are two different theories of how early hominins migrated. One of them has basically been poo-pooed and no one believes it, but you know, we'll put it up there just for um, interest sake. But this is basically the, um, the best supported theory of how humans evolved and then migrated. Okay, so we're looking now at Homo sapiens. Okay, so Homo sapiens following Homo erectus, you know, so 200 to 300,000 years ago. So this theory states that Homo sapiens evolved in Africa. Okay, so um, Homo erectus became, well, Australopithecines have only been found in Africa, um, same as Homo erectus, then evolved into Homo sapiens. So, you know, the early Homo sapiens lived in Africa. Then some of those um, early Homo sapien populations left Africa. So they migrated um, around 130,000 years ago. And they migrated close, you know, they went to Europe um, and um, Central Asia, which is obviously on the way out of Africa. Then we understand that the ones that left 130,000 years ago either went back or they died, okay? The reason for this is that fossils have been found, you know, around these parts of the world of early humans that have been dated to be 130,000 years old, but, you know, there's not a lot of fossils that are 110,000 years old. Okay, so there's kind of a big gap. So we've got fossils that are 130,000 years old and then more fossils that are kind of 70. There's been a few more recently that are closer to 90,000 years old. But that tells us that that was the time that humans really started um, migrating out of Africa um, properly. Okay, so obviously huge populations stayed within Africa, but some populations left. Okay, so they left Africa, they went up to Europe, they went across to Asia, um, and then they made it to Australia. Okay, so there would have been um, more sand bars available that actually would have allowed early humans to travel on foot to Australia. Same thing happened over to North America. Okay, so that migration occurred throughout the world. Um, obviously, um, different mutations occurred to different populations that were good for the environments they ended up in. And that's how we've got all of the diversity we have in humans now, because, you know, having, um, you know, a really fatty body type and light, light skin was really useful up in northern Russia or up in, um, you know, Alaska. 
um, because it was really cold and that insulated them. Being really um, lean and um, thin and having dark skin was really useful in hot climates like in um, Africa, in Australia, in a lot of Southern Asia. Um, the other theory is this theory that Homo erectus populations, so before Homo sapiens, Homo erectus left Africa and went to different parts of the world and then evolved into Homo sapiens independently. Um, but there's too many holes in that and hopefully you know enough about evolution now to go, it's so unlikely that, you know, the same types of mutations would have been occurring in all these different populations to allow Homo erectus to have evolved in all these different areas. Okay, so this is really um, the best explanation. Um, again, this, this, these final two slides now are really looking at um, newer bits of evidence and this stuff is changing all the time. There's constantly new articles about these. But um, many fossils have been found around the world in different parts of the world that show that Homo sapiens lived in certain areas at the same time as other early human, well, other hominin species. Um, the two main big ones being Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, and a newer one called Homo denisova. When I say newer, I mean we've found out about this more recently through fossils. So in Eurasia, so parts of um, kind of Europe and Asia around here, there are caves where they have found Homo sapien fossils and Neanderthal fossils that are the same age. Okay, so let's say 60, 70,000 years ago. Okay, that means that they lived side by side. Um, in Siberia, so kind of up in um, northern Russia here, there's a cave where they discovered this um, previously unknown hominin that they've called um, Homo denisova, or we call them denisovans. Again, fossils of denisovans and Homo sapiens, same age, same place. Okay, so that tells us that they were living side by side. Um, it also tells us that more likely than not, we killed them. Um, where it gets really interesting <laughs> is that using that information, you know, scientists would have gone, well, okay, we know that they were living side by side. We know they were quite similar species. So what was their relationship? Um, so DNA studies were done looking at DNA from current humans, so current living human populations, um, also the DNA of Neanderthals. So um, DNA has been extracted from Neanderthal um, bones that have been found and also some DNA from Denisovan. They found a finger bone that had some quite well preserved DNA. So they've looked at the DNA and found that in current human populations, there is some Neanderthal DNA. In other human populations, there is some Denisovan DNA. Okay, what that tells us is that interbreeding must have been occurring. So at some point, some humans were interbreeding with some Denisovans, and in other places, some humans were interbreeding with Neanderthals. And that DNA is still preserved in the genome of modern human groups. This is really important for helping us to figure out were Neanderthals and Denisovans, were they a different species of the Homo genus or were we all subspecies? Okay, so subspecies, um, you know, might have different appearances and things like that, but if they're part of the same species, they can breed and produce fertile offspring. Okay, so really, really fascinating stuff um, in this area, and there's always new evidence about this, um, but it's really important to note, I guess, that 
our understanding of evolution changes all the time or it gets more deep as more fossils are found and that DNA is tested and we can see more things about them. Um, and that is basically it for the revision. So like I said, make sure you're using the um, checklist as well and do as many practice questions as you can. Um, and I'm more than happy to jump onto Zoom and answer questions if anyone wants to go through particular things again. Thanks.